Hey! <laughs> Jesus. Come on. Hey! <laughs> Don't do that. I'm alone here. <laughs> it's episode 67. I am mad. No. Um, it's <laughs> episode 67 of Alex and Jim Analyze Billy Joel Lyrics. I'm Alex. That's Jim. These are lyrics. The lyrics that we analyze. Billy Joel's not here. Nope. <laughs> not, not yet. Not yet. Or ever. Maybe the hundredth episode spectacular. <laughs> yep. Uh before we talk about the song, I will just preface this by saying that last week when I picked the song, I'm not gonna say the name yet because it's too early. We haven't done nonsense yet. But always nonsense first. That's the that's our format. But oh, yeah. I will say, I said, wow, this song is terrible. And then I listened to it a couple times. It's not. No, it's perfectly nice. And uh, I, I have thoughts about what it, who he's aping. You know, we talk about that a lot. I have yeah. thoughts about that. And I'm going to write it down so I don't forget. And then the fact that I could forget this shows you that I'm an old man. Because once I say it, you'll go, well, you guys said that a lot. How would you forget that, you dummy? And I go, well, I'm an old man. And then you go, oh, I'm sorry. And I get your medicine. That's what you'd say. Well, I would not do or say any of that because I'm an older man than you are. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. And I also forgot what song we were doing. <laughs> it is <laughs> The Long Night. Oh, well, no wonder I forgot. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. not on me. <laughs> yeah, it is uh, barely a song. Um, but I want to tell you one thing I did this week, and then I highly advise you to do it. Oh. Letterman okay. has now, is now been allowed, he must have made peace with NBC. Uh -huh. Because he's now allowed on his channel to show a bunch of clips from the original show. Oh, fantastic. And that was on NBC. And for a long time, they wouldn't let him do that because they, they it was an acrimonious party. Oh, yeah. Uh, mainly because he's an acrimonious human being. <laughs> yeah, he probably made some acrimony. Yeah, but uh, I was just watching some old Bob and Ray. Oh, and great. I think not enough young people have seen Bob and Ray. One of the, yeah. And one of the things they would do, Bob and Ray, is Bob would talk about how, you know, not a lot of people give enough attention to our dry cleaning, uh, the people who do our dry cleaning. So I thought I'd interview a guy who is the world's best dry cleaner. And that would be the premise. And then he would start to interview, and Ray would be the best dry cleaner. He would not change his voice in any no. way, shape, or form. He wouldn't put on a hat. Nothing. And sometimes half the joke would be they never get around to talking about dry cleaning. And I love that kind of comedy. Clearly. <laughs> we talk about, did any famous people come into the dry cleaner? You go, no, no, but I will tell you that the guy who runs the local pizzeria would come in and my goodness, his clothes were always filthy. And then he, Bob would go, Oh, that's a good pizzeria. And he realized they're not talking about dry cleaning. Fantastic. And, and they were subtle is not it. Subtle is doesn't do them justice. No, it, they were slight. Slight is like good. Slight. Yes. Comedy. Yeah, and it was you wouldn't laugh right away, and then suddenly you were you suddenly you were in it, and once you were in it, it was the funniest thing. So great. Um, it was a time when every we all had more time, yeah, to do comedy and listen to it and just and and then this is like 40 years ago, this was happening. Mm-hmm. It was enough for people because we weren't overstimulated. I feel like it was enough that two guys were pretending to be somebody else. Yep. And you were like, oh, this is art. I think and there's a place. On top of that is just frosting for me. Yep. I think there's a place for it if somebody had the courage to do it. Because honestly, you'd have to have courage. Whenever I see comedians, yeah. Gary Goldman reminds me of this. Uh, by the way, he liked uh the last tweet about our show just oh, great like, he's a good man he didn't have to do that uh gary goldman is like this he'll unfold things slowly 
Mm-hmm. And in comedy, man, nowadays that takes the actual courage. He is an old fashioned comic in a lot of ways. There's honestly no courage in making fun of a marginalized group. There's no courage in talking about politics. There, there could be comedy in it. I'm not saying that's not. Sure. The courage is being willing. Maybe this has always been true. Courage in comedy has always been being willing to sit inside of a silence. Yeah. Or to hold back the punchline. Yeah. Until you're ready. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, I was going to say you don't see it much, but where would you see it? <laughs> where do you see, unless you go to a club yeah. or casino, there, it doesn't live anywhere in the television universe the way it did tw- even 10 years ago. Yeah. See good long stand up sets. And now you get five, you get a tight five on a talk show. Yeah. And you don't have time to set up a joke that pays off <laughs> three minutes down the line. Yeah. You've done two jokes in your set. Tight five is not a courtesy to um, comedy. It's not. No. It's not good for it. No. There's a. Um, there, by the way, there's certain comics too, by the way, who at five minutes seem hilarious. And at 10, you go, Ugh, God. Oh, yeah. yeah. They only had five minutes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, or they have one trick. And over the course of a set, you're like, oh, so that's, you do that. <laughs> right. And nothing else. Yeah. All right. Every joke is that variated. God. Um, <laughs> anyway, I'm going to recommend Bob and Ray. You have something to share that you were kind enough off the air. This is a little... thing I will not recommend. Uh, <laughs> and it is in many ways, it's a joke that took a long time to unfold. Even though the person perpetrating the joke was not aware. Sue, my lovely uh, esposa, um, it's like, oh, uh, Friday night, you don't work. Let's go see a show of some kind. I said, great, whatever you want to do, you get tickets, we'll go see something. Great, I get a text when I'm at work. I got us ticklet- tickets to Hamlet. Uh, playing at the Brooklyn Art Museum, uh, which has a, a giant theater space as well. I was like, wow. okay, great. We'll go see Hamlet. She's like, yes, there's apparently this great German director who is directing it, and it's very avant-garde and cool. I was like, all right, cool. So we trouble ourselves up, try to look nice, try to select the right jacket for in-between season, and we walk a mile and a half down the street to the Brooklyn Art Museum theater space. They're a half hour early, have a cocktail. There's lots of murmuring. We're looking around. Do we know anybody? No, it doesn't seem like we do. Okay. We sit down and Hamlet starts and it's in German. <laughs> and not only did I not know that, Sue didn't know that. <laughs> And I said, how did you pick this? And she said, I read a review. Uh, And I said, the review didn't mention that it was entirely in German? (laughs) I mean, if you go, sure, acting is great. But if you go to Shakespeare, (laughs) the language really is kind of a draw. Right. And man, does it not translate well into German because it either sounds like there's either like a sad soliloquy which always sounds like a serial killer or there's an angry tirade which sounds like Hitler and those are your two choices that's so great and by the way I I picture a lot of things from Germans uh troubled by doubt is not one of them no no uh, worried about going insane? No. no. Happy, to go, happy to go insane. I picture German Hamlet being he immediately kills his uncle. Just immediately. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Before finding out about the poisoning or anything. Yeah, and it's a coincidence. Like, yeah. <laughs> do not care for your tone. Kill. Wow. 
Wow. And then the punchline really is that we stayed for the whole thing and it was three and a half hours long and it was really good. <laughs> that, I was going to say, I bet you still had fun. I bet it, it was. was really cool production with lots of uh, cool design and uh, set tricks and lighting moves and film pieces. You know, it's very I, German. Yeah, I figured it, this out late in life and maybe you figured this out too is there's different ways to enjoy a thing and if you remember that you were able to with your lovely wife sue discover a way to enjoy this a way in to your pleasure a way into your entertainment yes it's not entertaining us the way it intended to maybe right but we can (laughs) we're good at drawing entertainment from the atmosphere and there's something like you actually you crossed my mind because I did think three minutes into it, part of me was like, we're leaving, right? And then I thought in uh, like you appeared to me like a Jedi ghost and kind of said, it's funnier to stay. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, it is funnier if we stay through this whole thing. That's great. <laughs> that is great. Uh Similarly, yeah. similarly, I have a Hamlet story, oddly enough, to relate to yours. But similarly, you remember the show Lost? Sure. I didn't watch the show Lost. It was not a show I lost. I watched, but I had friends who watched it. And I decided, like, in the fourth or fifth season to watch an episode <laughs> without any context for that oh. episode. And I promise you, I enjoyed it more than anybody who was up to speed. I'm sure that's true. I loved it because what I was like, I was like, I'm going to try to figure out what's going on. (laughs) And it was really fun to watch because I was like, because the island did a weird thing. I didn't know an island could do that islands do in that show, but not regular islands. Sure. And not even at... Not even the restaurant islands would do this. And um, (laughs) and I enjoyed that. And then there was this character who they were looking at some of his belongings as a child. I was like, oh, and and you maybe if you know the show, you know that scene where they're looking at this bald guy's possessions. Okay. Who was apparently significant. And I described that episode to hold on one second. Yeah. One of the sounds you love when you're recording is a blender. Oh. Everyone nice. loves a fucking blender, Jimmy Christmas. Sticky drinks. Yeah. Um, no, breakfast. Breakfast for somebody who should have gotten up hours ago. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds right. You know, breakfast to, for somebody who was following Gary Goldman's The Big Depression way of getting up. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, so I described the episode to somebody in the, who knew what was going on, and they enjoyed the way I described it because they were like, oh, man, you watched a different show than I did. Yeah. Um, so this is my Hamlet story, and it's a quick story. The first time I saw Hamlet live, I was probably seven years old. Oh, boy. And Early. some high schoolers came to my school. They were in some traveling art program where they were performing Hamlet for us. And Hamlet was performed, was portrayed by a girl actress. Okay. Um, which is, a, which I didn't know at the time was actually a nice, a, f- a fun thing to do with Shakespeare to go, well, now it's all ladies because you dicks sure. wouldn't let ladies be in it originally. <laughs> Right. But I got a huge crush on Hamlet because she was a teenage girl and I was seven years old and she was really cute. And I end up, it turns out that I have a lifelong ability to develop crushes on girls who are probably lesbians. I'm just great at that. They're pretty great. They are because they're, you know, they're oftentimes strong and they're beautiful and confident because they because if they're out they're confident yeah the very nature of coming out means that you're like i know who i am and that's an attractive quality sure and it's, it's just a, a bummer one you never have to master yeah 
and uh and so i was just fawning all over and getting her autograph and i asked for her phone number which now i'm in retrospect i was seven <laughs> as for a phone number which meant that i was gonna dial her phone at my mom's house yeah yeah hey remember that child you met I promise someday I'll get an erection. <laughs> the child you met just as you're getting interested in people five years older than you. <laughs> yep. Five years older than you and not boys. Not, not so not boys. Oh man. But she was very nice. I remember that in that she, right. I didn't, I believe the word is humored me is what she did. She oh, okay. humored me. Um, yeah, I have a long history of just having a crush on whatever lady is in a play. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, oh, I mean, same thing. It's like, oh, the confidence you need to be on a stage and do this. And yeah, and, you, know, you probably has a lot more to do with the character a lot of times. <laughs> You're like, oh, she seems she's got her shit together. Yeah. Why well, don't what well, actresses always do? I hope that's not the case with me where I'm only just the attracted to people who may murder their uncle <laughs> uh, i think you're uh, titillated by the possibility yeah well i hey i'm not against it i'll say that for sure we gotta stay interested yeah got a, got a cameo coming in come on oh, oh we're lucky like cameo oh my goodness you know here we right. go fence is pretty, killing me. yeah pretty kitty yeah Hi, pretty She's kitty. 20 years old. Happy birthday. <laughs> yeah, today. <laughs> uh, uh, did, did you see my dumb Hanukkah joke? Did I see your dumb Hanukkah joke? Yes. Good. Okay. I'm trying to remember what it was, but I did see it. Well, my because uh, we've got crisp advent calendars for dogs. Ah, uh, yes. And which is true. There's advent calendars for dogs, but which annoys me because my dogs are Jewish. They celebrate the 14 days of Hanukkah. <laughs> and that is a pretty good joke. That's a pretty good joke as far as Hanukkah jokes go. Yeah. The other joke I made in Stand Up this week is I, I won't tell the joke, but I'll tell the setup to the joke as I go. I'm going to tell my Christmas joke. Ugh. Jim pr keeps bringing out his Christmas jokes earlier and earlier. It's not even Thanksgiving. <laughs> that, was, that was the joke. <laughs> That's great. I liked that part, but I really wanted to tell the joke because a lot of times around Christmas, people don't bother doing shows. Right. Yes. And, and they're we'll put in January. And they're right to do that. As you oh. and I remember from being young people who were in improv groups or sketch groups or whatever, sure. it would always be your dipshit idea to do a show near Christmas because you're like, people are going to be looking for something to do. <laughs> right. Yeah. We always thought, oh, there's a market for us. And it was never a market. And there, there's not even a market for us in spring. You know there's not one in December. Oh, it, whenever somebody came, a lot of people came to an improv show is because there was cheap beer. Yeah. Um, or another show afterwards that they were waiting for. <laughs> or they didn't know there was a show at all. A lot of times they didn't know. Or they were also in your improv class. Right. Not on the team. One of my favorite things to happen is when there's a show that's basically a ambush show because it's at a bar or it's at a library or it's at a bookstore or it's at a, you know, laundromat. That's a real thing. And that's fine. It's an ambush show. You're going to do show in, shows in front of people who didn't know there was going to be a show. But there's invariably a comic who starts berating people for not liking that this happened to them and the, the berating that goes on in comedy clubs <laughs> the i mean it's a lot of it is well earned on the part of the audience if it's a comedy club it's all a well earned a lot of times but yeah. if they didn't know there was going to be a damn show yeah what can you do yeah i used to run into that i used to host karaoke in the days when you had to bring the machine to the bar oh yeah they didn't just have a system sure you had to, like drive there in a white van <laughs> and unload all these giant pieces of equipment 
and, and this was in Chicago. So often you would do that and set everything up and then you would turn off the Cubs game <laughs> so that you could sing little Barry Manilow songs and people would flip out. Yeah. Would, Look, man, the bar owner made a deal with my boss. <laughs> this has, this, I'm not spontaneously doing this. And it says karaoke night on the door. <laughs> uh related we used to uh, i was in this group called trouser shock which to this day there's a lot of work that i'm very proud of that we did some of it you can actually watch just really good sketches that have aged wonderfully well because it just none of it was racist um, <laughs> but uh one of the bits we did for live shows was when we'd have like if whatever the stage setup is so if you're in a broke dick sketch group the stage setup is however the theater was already set up yes you're yeah. not putting up scrims you're not doing any set design right so and sometimes you would be in there uh doing your show on a dark night when they actually was a play was going on oh so like sometimes you would be like one time we did a show and behind us was a video store rental place all oh. set up like videotapes on shelves and whatever and you just can't mess with it and sometimes we'd write a scene that took place there or whatever right but as long as you don't move it but there was this place we went to that had a window that was the thing they had and we liked that they had a window so a bit we did is we brought a tv and put it in the window and we would record stuff so it'd be raining outside or a guy would walk by. It was pretty clever. But the best part of it was that the guy who was the producer is my friend Walker. It was his TV, and he always had to lug it upstairs. And that was always the funniest part to me. Sure. <laughs> Fucking poor <laughs> suck it. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, plug it in for two minutes of maybe comedy. How, well, how many people are in the crowd? Four. Ugh. All right. <laughs> so I always tried to think of an idea because I didn't want to ever have a day when he didn't have to bring the TV. <laughs> the worst. <laughs> uh, uh, often around the show. Yeah, it was so funny because I was just being a dick. But also it was still, it was a funny bit. So he's like, okay. <laughs> fantastic uh so listen here's what we decided so we've been talking about we've picked a lot of music off of piano man the last couple of weeks yeah Got, gotten over our uh fear of talking about that album and we finally have talked about some songs <laughs> and then it it prompted me to think about glass houses which was a huge album and i would say it was his biggest album as far as sheer hits and stuff maybe yeah. rivaled by an innocent man which did really well too but i like glass houses better on top of its success although i do like an innocent man uh and then i was just like looking at the songs and i was like oh this ain't a good song let's talk about that one <laughs> it's kind of funny how there's a stinker on an album even if it's a good album it feels like we might have done almost every other song i bet um, we have yeah close to it on glass houses because there's it's bangers it's man bangers. banger main it's ones you want to talk about because they're great and then there's this one through the long night and i listened to it and i was like okay this isn't as bad as i thought it was gonna be and here's who i think it is mm. it's a paul mccartney composition uh -huh. for for wings that's a little Beatles-esque, but isn't his best work. <laughs> it reminds me of that. It's a little ditty. It's such a it's a small ditty. It's a it's an effort, but it's not <laughs> a lot of effort. It's not a lot of effort. It feels like it maybe isn't done. Yep. And it feels like a song that wandered in from another album. <laughs> Yeah, it isn't it's out of place. It's lost. 
It's going to hang yeah. out here for a while until it finds its album, which is, I think might be Cold Spring Harbor. Right. <laughs> yeah, it feels like McCartney. Like with McCartney, I think a lot of times it was laziness that came from being so good. Yes. I think McCartney sometimes would just jot something down in the magic of the Beatles. You always like, what did, what does one ma- band member bring to another? And I think half of what the other band members brought to each other was, ah, that ain't good. Yes. You need That's a guy good. to say that. No, not, not good enough. And you need to fix this part or them to go, what if it was this? And, and, and you know, if you're Paul McCartney, ain't nobody saying that anymore. Right. Um, but John did a lot back in the days. Yep. Okay, that's a nice little song, but it needs some weirdness. Yep. Some crazy lyrics. <laughs> yeah, it needs something, something. And then John would get mad. There's legendary stories about him being mad about Obla D because he was like, that was never going to be good. <laughs> <laughs> and uh and the funny thing is it was a hit i think i think so but it still wasn't it's not great no it's like a nice little children's song yeah sort of. it's 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 hit status i think comes entirely from it being the beatles i yeah i imagine so i don't think and and it isn't like i'm, I'm certainly not saying it's bad certainly not saying i could write better i definitely couldn't but it's definitely just not just John's right about that one. <laughs> <laughs> That's all. And yeah. this is what it seemed like to me is felt like this is a little bit of, you know, Billy Joel likes the Beatles and he's influenced by, and probably by more, nobody more than Paul in the Beatles. Yes. Influences. Being, just, it, uh, yeah. This is a, yeah. Uh, ultimately uh yeah that's who you would like <laughs> in the beatles yeah um he, he probably thought like oh john lennon's too political or weird and uh ringo's too aloof I, i'm from long island i'm a working class guy i don't like the aloof yeah and he's like george uh, plays guitar i don't know what that is so i'm gonna <laughs> i'm gonna latch on to paul it was a unabashed romantic nerd. Yep. You know, you just said something really interesting I'd never even put together, but so they're from Long Island. He's from Long Island. Yeah. These guys were from the Long Island of Britain. Oh, that's true. I did never dawned on me. I'm like, fuck yeah, you could really these because the thing about the Beatles that it probably did help was that they were they were working class dudes. Yeah. Hey, are you watching? This is related, I promise. Are you watching a show called Welcome to Wrexham? No. By any Should I? It, yes. It is a documentary series uh, wherein Ryan Reynolds, famous actor, and Rob McElhenney, less famous actor, who was oh. on Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Good show. The two of them uh, purchased a struggling Welsh soccer team and uh, poured some money into their system and uh it's the documentary of their first season as owners of this team wow and one of the threads that keeps running through it is rob McElhenney is from philadelphia grew up in a very scrappy way and he relates very well to the people of wrexham because it's like an, an old factory town or mining yeah. of course like nothing's going on there now everyone's struggling um but the the idea that yeah uh, the language is different and you know the money is different <laughs> they drive on the wrong side but the spiritual connection of like working class recognizes working class yeah that is a fun thread in that show and yeah that, that, that that's the, great the beatles and billy joel yeah, for sure. Oh, yeah, that and you're right, it is related. It's I I don't know why it never occurred to me because I guess that I don't think too much of the Beatles working class roots because that's not what attracted me to them was their music, but no, and it's interesting how much uh hate they got from the American working class. Yeah. Yeah. Um, upon arrival. Of course, and especially, they, they were very yeah. foppish by the time they showed up. Well, they, but they were always 
sticking it to the upper class of Brit Britain because they just didn't care for him. Yep. Made made fun of the queen as politely as they could, but made fun of her. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God. It's so great. So I didn't hate the song the way I thought I was going to hate it. I thought this was going to be an episode of like, hey, it'll be fun to kind of hate talk about this song. but <laughs> It's got something. It does. And you know, it's funny. It just me being a just, just a mope. Just like when I was looking at the lyrics, the shape of the lyrics made me think this has got to be bad. And I wasn't even looking <laughs> at the words, just the shape of it. <laughs> they appeared on the page. Uh, what a what a sophisticated thought process I had. I don't like the shape of them letters. It is a truly uh, a shortcut. It is a real lyric hack. <laughs> They're like, oh, the shape is off. Yeah, this is gonna stink. <laughs> yeah, just do me a favor. Draw a picture of how the lyrics. So the sentence goes out to there. Oh, I don't like that. I don't like that at all. Sense goes, <laughs> and then it goes back down to here. That's got to be bad. Oh, that's not good. So, <laughs> so it's not terrible. It's listenable. If I were listening to Glass Houses, the album, all the way through, which I've done, yeah, there's no reason I would just go, hey, so-and-so that I don't want to say out loud because you'll respond. Skip. I won't say that. But uh, And if I get it on my album, I'm not going to lift it up. And see. I'll listen to it, and I'll enjoy it. But I certainly wouldn't, there'd be no good reason to seek it out. No. Uh, however, right in the very first lyric, there's something I immediately like. So I'll start. All right. The cold hands, the sad eyes, the dark Irish silence. <laughs> I like that. I mostly like that. I think... I can hear his process where he was thinking, I want this to feel Irish. And then like sat at the piano for two hours and then was like, oh, fuck it. I'll just say Irish. <laughs> oh. That kind of laziness. It's lazy, but I'll, I'll tell you. Why Irishness or make people think of Ireland. And then he was like, I don't know how, though. So Irish. <laughs> <laughs> can I can I tell you something? You're right. It, there is some laziness, but luckily, if you're talking about the Irish, it works because yeah. one thing about the Irish will bring up being Irish. Yeah, <laughs> true. We will bring it up more. Certainly, Italians will talk about it in reference to food. You know, well, my Italian mother, blah blah blah, or whatever. But man, the Irish do. We do want you to know we're Irish. Yes. We want you to know God that. Bless. God bless. The, the sad God. eyes, the dark Irish silence. I like dark Irish silence because also I'm familiar with dark Irish silence and I'm like, it's, eh. it's. I feel like it's quieter than other silences. You know what it is? Irish silence is, is jarring because people had been talking so much. Yes. People and were singing. and singing gregarious, telling stories with details that were unnecessary but fun to hear. Playing very tiny pipes. <laughs> very tiny pipes that look like vape pens. And then when that silence hits. Oh, buddy. It's a brooding, brooding, dark silence. I can remember that as a kid. Mom, quiet wasn't good. Oh. Mom, quiet. I, I'm from Italian, and uh, silence is great. <laughs> it's the screaming <laughs> that gets you. Yeah. It was Man. not quiet. If somebody was mad, it was not quiet. Yeah. Irish silence is, here's the thing about Irish silence, too, is be real careful about disrupting the silence. Oh, yes. I can only imagine. Yeah. Yeah, oh, there's because it's kind of like, and then if you do manage to disrupt it with your tomfoolery, oh yeah, then what you're going to hear is not going to be enjoyable, and also you're going to feel a few things, whether yeah. they're from hands or shoes, slippers if you're lucky, regular shoes maybe, clogs, clogs, 
<laughs> He'll take a clog. Oh my God. But yeah. it's so late. Well, but one of my favorite lines from Goodwill Hunting, which there's an Irish idiot, uh, is <laughs> there's a line where he says that his dad would make me choose the uh a switch from a tree or a tire iron. And he's and Robin Williams says, I, I got if it's me, I take the the switch from the tree. He goes, nah, I take the tire iron. And he goes, why the tire iron? Because fuck you, that's why. <laughs> and I love that line, and it feels real to me. It feels really good. That's a good, honest, like, this relationship is never going to be healed. No. I'm hoping to get out of it alive, is the hope in that one. Um, have you seen The Banshees of Inishirin? No, sir. A new film with uh, Colin Farrell and Brendan Gleeson, written by Martin McDonough. I've heard about it. I want to see it. It's all about kind of a dark Irish silence oh. in that um, one of two friends just decides he doesn't want to be friends anymore with this guy. And that is the first scene. <laughs> That's really cool. The entire um, town descends into chaos. <laughs> it's fantastic. That's pretty great. Oh my God, the dark. See, man, this, I was so wrong because I already like this. Now I'm sure there's going to be a lot I don't like. All right. <laughs> I think, uh, uh, it, I still think it was lazy of him, but it is evocative. Yeah. And he hasn't done this specific version of the trick, Dark Irish Silence. Not like there's that's a bunch good. of, so that's good. It's so late, but I'll wait through the long night with you, with you. Now, I like, okay, so I'll wait. So this is what I feel like this means. Certainly what it means to me is you got somebody who's dark and brooding, and boy, it's not easy to get through. No. And I've decided you're worth it or I'm broken enough <laughs> that I'm going to wait it out and yeah. try to and try to be there on the other side of the dark Irish silence that's what it feels like i'd like that it oh, we have to figure out what it feels like it means because there's not his uh bad habit of telling us every fucking thing that's going on yep he tells us less than we need to know yep but enough to understand the feeling yeah i don't know what's happening but i see i understand pretty well what the feeling is on the part of both parties um, it's yeah, I guess it's like the unintended uh, good news about the shape of the lyrics, right? <laughs> yeah, there's yeah. not a bunch of extra skin hanging off it. True, it is. It's good. If, so far, it's good. It's good poetry in that sense. He doesn't tell you everything, and yet you feel a lot of the intention. It is that is the lyric shape. It's uh, New Yorker poetry. Yeah. <laughs> It's like, oh, three words per line. We're not going to get a lot of info. <laughs> yeah. Feel away. <laughs> <laughs> so we have, well, they're waiting for something, maybe just for the long night to be over. Yeah. Uh, the night was bad. This could be a lot of damn things, too, because the long night, this could be, I'm not yeah. saying it is, but I. there's a lot of things it could be. It could be getting over the heroin shakes the long night it could be oh. a dumb fight it could be just yeah you're still processing your father or mother and this is a night when it hit yeah oh yeah yeah right especially okay. a long irish you know a dark irish silence is a lot of times ruminations about a family member that's for sure anniversary of something terrible yeah yeah, yeah. um yeah, I would like that it's a little spare. Yeah, me too. The warm tears, the bad dreams, the soft trembling shoulders. Nice. Yeah. The old fears, but mm -hmm. I'm here through the long night with you. With you. The old fears. I like that a lot. It's great. It's a great phrase because you don't need to know what they are. Mm -mm. You just know that place. Yeah. Sitting here with the old fears. Say no more. Yeah, it's good. A bunch of those. It doesn't matter what yours are or mine are. 
And I like, so I like that in the first lyric, we get a sort of general idea, uh, not even general, it feels specific enough. It feels foreboding and unpleasant and all that stuff. But we do get a little bit of color with, you know, soft shoulders and trembling and the old fear. So now we do get the idea that this is a, a, a loved woman. This, you know, this is a, a person that has old, and like you said, it doesn't matter because it's even better that you fill them in yourself. Yeah. Like in good music, you know, when you want to know what they threw off the Tallahatchie Bridge, it's better for me to decide than to be told. Yes. What's in the Pulp Fiction briefcase? That's yeah. It's fun in my head. Wouldn't it what? be great, by the way, if in one interview he went, it's just papers. <laughs> just the briefcase. What do you think is it? They're important papers. Yeah. He was trying to indicate their importance by making them glow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, you'd ruin the song by telling. You know, you yeah. would, you would, it would be terrible. So that's actually quality songwriting right there as far as knowing that much. Yeah, I also like this. You can, you know from these lyrics that he's holding this person. Yeah. Uh, but he doesn't say like, I'm holding you, Debbie. Uh, <laughs> it's warm tears. Well, you wouldn't know unless they were falling on you. Yeah. Um, the soft trembling shoulders trembling you can see but soft you got to be there for yeah um so it's nice uh we you know we say all the time like just show don't tell yeah <laughs> and he's a big teller and this yeah. feels like a, a good example of showing yeah you can feel his character billy joel you can feel his character exhibiting compassion and there's a sense of, again, something not present in his songs very often. A, right. a person who doesn't believe they have all the answers. Yeah. Because he's just holding them. You know, that... I That's when you're, you're out of ideas then. Early on in my relationship with Mary Jo, both would be before we got married even, uh, she would often share, you know, my, my wife had a tr troubled past. She had, you know, I mean, she was in the foster care system, for goodness sake. Sure. Um, she had her issues and things would come up and I would so often go, have you tried this? Have you tried this or whatever? Yeah. And she was kind enough once to say uh, something that I bet every woman has had to tell some idiot man. Hey, you know, sometimes I'm not looking for you to give me a solution. I would just like you to listen to me. Yeah. And I was somehow in my dull 20s <laughs> able to hear it. Great. And so we were able to build a relationship wherein I'm like, I think this is a listening time. Great. Yeah. That's a good head start for you. Yeah. Well, and it's probably why we're still together because I tried. Yeah. And you shut up and listened. Mm -hmm. Which not often enough, but enough. Well, not often, but enough. I find myself in a uh, a reverse situation where I have to tell Sue occasionally, like, don't solve it. I'm just telling you, I feel like shit today. Yeah. Oh, I, maybe you should eat this. I'm like, no, no, no. I'll eat what I want. I just feel shitty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just, just so as you know. Yeah. Just to tell you where I'm at. Yeah. And that's. You're not going uh... to fix, gonna fix it. Just telling you run up a flag yeah yeah that's yeah that's fun to get through your head so nice job doing that early yeah with her i wish i could have it's so funny because i wish i could have extrapolated but i was in my 20s and pretty dumb oh maybe other people like to be listened to too <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah maybe this but is kind of universal it was more like tell you something unique about mary joe she likes it when you listen to her he doesn't want me to solve her problems. Everybody else wants me to interrupt at a party and tell a story that had nothing to do with what was going on. Hmm. Well, some girls, some girls got to be different. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I will also say that I like, uh, you know, pop songs are by nature very repetitive in the lyrics. They have to be. Uh, you know, you'll hear choruses over and over again and... Uh, 
I've heard songwriters talk about that, where they wrote a song a certain way, and then they had to change it in the chorus, had to become more prominent, and then, you know. Right. Yeah, yeah. Make it rhyme more or something. Yep. But here, the repetition of Through the Long Night with You is nice. Yeah. Because it's a thick idea. Uh, the Long Night is heavy. And saying it again, sure, it serves a pop song, but it also serves, lyrically it serves, I think. It serves to say, and here we are still in the middle of that long night. I like that. Yeah. Um, I feel like this song benefited probably during the process from having no pressure on it. Yeah. Look, we got seven hits on this yeah. album. Unlike Pressure, which had all the pressure. All the pressure it comes up several times. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, you're right. True. And yeah, maybe you just forget. do one for you. You know, it wouldn't surprise me if you found out that this is a song that has a particular special warm place in his heart because of that. Because, oh my goodness, I was so wrong last week. This is funny. Mm -hmm. um, oh, what has it cost you? I almost lost you a long, long time ago. Oh, you should have told me, but you had to bleed to know. Great. Great line. And I don't feel like this is preachy, like you should have told me. Okay. It's more lamenting desire, and it's, in a way, it's a relief. There's a sense yeah. of relief that we got through you not being able to tell me. And and haven't we all wished that we'd have been smarter, uh, more open, or if, aware at a particular time when really just be glad you are now yeah and there's so many times when you're like oh i wish i had this positive quality when i was young and you slowly come to realize you couldn't have yeah because you didn't go through the thing yet yeah you had to bleed to know you had to bleed to know that's wonderful. I don't I don't feel that's a cliche at all. I think that's, oh, that's pretty great. Cool. I can't believe I haven't seen that elsewhere. Yeah, that's fantastic. Nice the only job. reason you haven't is it didn't happen to be a hit because like a lot of Billy Joel songs, if this was a hit, we'd all be going, did he say that first? Because everybody says bleed to know. Yeah, uh, right? there's a part of me that feels Billy Joel's more influential than he ever gets credit for because there's a lot of phrases sure. that I'm like. I think this moat made this up. <laughs> yeah. Um, separately and uh, off point, it's a great action movie title. Bleed to no God. On a bleed to no basis. Right. Oh, dude, are we? Okay, listen, there's got to be coffee Writing shops. Yeah, <laughs> bleed to no. <know. laughs> You gotta bleed to know it. It's a it's gotta be it's a James Bond style spy, but at the end of the line, training another James Bond style guy who don't know nothing. Yeah. And but who's great at his job? He's James Bond style. He does all this great stuff, and he goes and he goes, What's to regret? That was a bad guy. You gotta bleed to know. And then he gets to know somebody who's bad that he has to kill. Yeah. And he and he finally feels a death. Oh my god, listen. We got to write this. And Br Bruno Mars is clearly the rookie James Bond. And Billy Joel could play the guy on his way out. Yes, Billy Joel is our James Bond. <laughs> what <laughs> weird casting. A motorcycle. Yeah. Got a leather jacket. Yeah. <laughs> so you been around the block, kid. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Horowitz. Hank Horowitz, maybe. I'm just trying to think of what his name is. <laughs> uh Horowitz is pretty great. <laughs> yeah. Hank Horowitz. Yep. Hank Horowitz. Uh I'd like what what do you want to drink? Anything. That's that's his <laughs> drink of choice. I brought stuff. <laughs> I'm uh, good. Yeah. <laughs> Sir, you can't bring that in here. You can't bring your own stuff in here. This is a restaurant. Ah. I'm Hank Horowitz. <laughs> Oh, oh, that's angry. Oh, oh, okay. sorry, sorry, Mr. Horowitz. Sorry, sorry Mr. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, Jiminy Christmas, that's good. <laughs> that's good and dumb. <laughs> no, 
that matters. All right, here and now this is uh, I have a needle scratch for me. Yeah. All your past sins are since past. Boo. Yeah, you know what? You should have leaned in, and I'm not joking. It should be all your past sins are sins past. And it's a better lyric immediately. All your past sins yeah. are sins past. Now that just sounds like something an Irish priest would say. Yeah. So it would it would give you your Irish. It would and, and I'm not even saying that's great. It's just better. Better than since past. Yeah. All your past sins are since past. Ugh. You should be sleeping. Now here's preachy Billy Joel. <laughs> yeah. He waited as long as he could, but he had to should. You should be sleeping. It's all right. Sleep tight through the long night with me. Now I don't I like the three rhymes. Yeah. Triple rhyme is nice. Don't like sleep tight. It's infantilizing. Yeah. Um we know it, she she's got warm tears and soft shoulders, but it's not a child. No, and it occurs to me too that I understand the instinct as a storyteller to <laughs> want to offer a resolution. Sure, but this song would be better without one. It would right. be better, like okay, all your past sins are sins past. You should be sleeping. Um, it's all right, but not for you tonight through the long night with me would be better immediately because just it's not all right to her. Right. And, yeah, I, yeah. and then we'd still be acknowledging rather than now there is a little preaching. And again, we're a little sensitive to this because we've analyzed a lot of Billy Joel lyrics, <laughs> yeah. but it is a little bit of like telling her that this isn't a problem. And, yeah. well, that's not, it. well, it is. You've overstepped. If someone's yeah. crying and you say, it's all right, you're incorrect. Yeah. <laughs> Clearly. Um, uh, you're trying to control the narrative when you were supposed to be there in a support role. Yeah, you go, it'll be all right, is a fine thing to say. Sure, you don't sure. even have to believe that. Right. But it's, it's a good right. Yeah. Even fine. Yeah. Right. You're going to be all right, you know. It's all right. Did you just hear what I told you about my uncle? No, it's all right. Cause... No, he's fine. <laughs> my uncle's fine. He's alive. Yeah. Just yeah. saw him. No, no. Oh. He died in a car wreck 10 years ago. No, 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 no. He's fine. No, no, no. No, no. He's alive. We'll call him tomorrow. <laughs> we'll call him to call him right now. Hey, Dave. <laughs> hey, he's fine. No, you can't talk to him. Well, you have to go to bed. Okay, bye. Click. Go to bed. Here, drink this. <laughs> you should be sleeping. It's all right. Sleep tight. Yeah. Yeah, it does take not a great turn. It still doesn't make it a bad song, but... No, awkward turn. And I would feel like, I think poetically, it feels like this sh sh song should start in the muck and end in the muck. I don't yeah. think it solves the muck. I think that this is just, this isn't a story. This is really more like a postcard snapshot yeah. of a of a place in time. A little vignette. Yeah. Um, yeah, don't try to do too much inside the vignette. Yeah. When your lyrics are that skinny. Yeah. I mean, look at the shape. Look at I'm the not shape. Gonna get a, I'm not going to get a solution like there, please. No, there's no poems that have like a great life hack. Yeah, <laughs> it's like oh, yeah, I've now I feel away for a while. Yeah, all right, that's all I need. Yeah, the end of Thanatopsis isn't like oh, and but you know sometimes it's nice to go to a diner. You're like oh, okay, you're right. I guess it's all right. <laughs> oh, all your sins past, all your past sins are since past. Now you are right. That is not great. Not great. Um, I now this next lyric isn't about the fire, but it could be. <laughs> no i didn't start it you're broken hearted by the way that was an attempt to rhyme yeah 
from a long, long time ago. Oh, the way you hold me is all that I need to know. See, this, I don't mind this lyric, except for the previous lyric. <laughs> kind of mucks it up. Because yeah. if we still were just dealing that this is how it is, our resolution simply could have been you acknowledging I'm okay just being here for you through this. Right. No, I didn't start it. You're brokenhearted from a long, long time ago. Oh, the way you hold me is all that I need to know. I mean, that sentiment is lovely. You don't yeah. need to tell me extra stuff. You don't need to answer questions. It could have even been that he asked questions and she said, I can't talk about that right now. I don't want to talk about that. Mm -hmm. And he had the presence of mind to say, that's fine. We don't need to. But it's mucked up by the previous set of lyrics. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. uh, it's it's funny because those are the only problem. I mean, you'll get to yours, and it's just that past sins since past set <laughs> that kind of just doesn't quite do it. Yeah, and you can't just cut them out, and you gotta have something there. I I think quantity oh, yeah. wise, quantity wise, something needs to be there. It's not just take it out. No. Clean it up. Fix it. Fix it. Come on, Billy. Come on, nope. Billy. <laughs> no. Uh, yeah. No, I didn't start it. <laughs> it's a weird... Also, you know, are you there for her or you? Right. You're right. He's making it... Hey, this ain't my fault, right? I mean, I'm here for you, but this ain't my fault, right? Yeah. Well, when we've all done that, like, you're crying, but it's not my fault, right? <laughs> yeah. All right. Oh, they're there then. And that's when in I the back... Good. Yeah. <laughs> But they're good, right? And that means that his inner monologue was, ah, oh, shit, what I do? what yeah. I do? what I do? Yeah. She found out. Oh, fuck. Right. She didn't find oh. out. Oh, oh. oh, she didn't find out. Oh, that's really funny. Sure is. I'll stay here all night then. Oh, man. You know that trick, by the way, that liars learn. Um, back when I was still a liar, I don't lie no more. But uh, back when I would still ha have my fibs, yeah, I, I learned the trick of like, oh, don't don't act mad. That's a tell. <laughs> yeah, and then you're like, no, no, it's all chill, and you're and that by the way works. You act all chill, and nobody figures nothing out, and then you just feel bad, and you realize that maybe I just shouldn't be lying. Yeah, this is I got away with it, but that's not fun. Yeah, now I'm a brutal truth teller. By the way, I'm like, yeah, oh. I, yeah. This, is this thing I did today. Yeah, fucking taking shit down. But of course, half of it is because um, stuff I'm doing is a lot less interesting anyway. <laughs> yeah, I'm finding that myself. Yes, yeah, so, you know, There's a lot. Nothing, nothing worth lying about. Yeah, lying now is like, no, I didn't have a donut. Do you remember the Norm Macdonald bit about lying that he used to do? Oh, yes. <laughs> Did you ever lie for no reason? <laughs> Somebody will say, did you see that new Julia Roberts movie? And you go, yes. <laughs> My favorite part is he goes, why, why am I lying about this here? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what? I, what uh, this in no way benefits me. <laughs> that is a lovely joke. There's a other tiny joke he tells within a larger thing that is so Norm MacDonald about face you know people got to face their fears you know face death and he goes man i'm not like that i'm not brave at all if i'm ever facing death or the devil i'd be like no please don't take me take my nephew he's young and supple <laughs> great <laughs> oh what a good fun yeah for a bunch of norm clips come up on my feet all the time and the you forget how many irresponsibly wrong things he loved to say oh yeah the glee the glee that he always had do you remember his crocodile hunter joke oh god i don't think i do he was he goes he was talking about the crocodile hunter and it was on the daily show and it was back with the uh what's his name um sure the jewish kid yeah the jewish kid was hosting 
yeah, and he, yeah. he goes, I want to talk about the crocodile hunter. And he goes, uh, he goes, uh, can you believe the tr- crocodile hunter died? And I'm like, yeah, I can. And he goes, he was only 40. And he goes, 40, that's a ripe old age for a crocodile hunter. <laughs> and what's, what is his name? Um, John Stewart goes, please don't make me laugh at this publicly. <laughs> And it was so funny because it was like, I just like the phrasing because he would often would he would play dumb, but he would trick you with how clever he was with the phrasing. Yes. Because he would go, that's a ripe old age for a crocodile hunter. <laughs> the greatest way to say that. Well, now listen, listen. What uh, are we do? Look at that. Oh, well, let's close it and say good song worth listening to. Sure. Beatles ask the tune's fine. The tune's not Couple great. Of real speed bumps. The music's not wonderful, by the way. This isn't one of those, but it's so no. pretty. It's not that. No, it's l- nice. Yeah, but it isn't one of those where you're like, but but it's, you know, beautiful piano music. It isn't. It's just no. pr- pretty modest, mediocre, Paul McCartney-esque pop music. I that's all. Well said. Yeah. But look at that. Look, look at that. that. I love dirty laundry. Right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. The classic Billy Joel song. <laughs> ah, we're putting some detergent in the washer. I absolutely am. And the only hint I'm going to tell you is that we're looking at it and that's name brand. <laughs> we're looking at it? You and I are looking at that picture and that's some name brand detergent. Ah. I don't see now. I don't know my detergents on site. Should I? Well, it's it's a it's the brand everybody should pretty much uh, know. Guide. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all for Lena. That's right. We're watching the tide go in. <laughs> That's a good damn joke. If you watch the show, that oh, is a good joke, and it's a nice picture. Tide. I could have picked a more obvious one. That is, by the way, Tide. And part of the reason I picked this is I really <laughs> want sponsorship. Oh, yeah. I want Lena's, my- Lena's plumbing supply. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Come on, call us. Call us, Lena's plumbing supply. <laughs> And, and I was also really delighted that sometimes I'll pick a picture and like, it'll be this picture, but the hand is this big because oh, sure. I, I can't frame it right. I'm like, no, this is perfect. Everything's clear. It's really nicely done. That's a nice machine. You'd love to have that machine at your house. If you had that machine, you'd count yourself lucky. It's a good machine. Oh, yeah, that's a sweet machine. See, I've got the, the apartment, the New York apartment uh, stackers. Oh, Yeah. They're a little smaller than the real ones. And yeah. uh, if you want to dry a towel, oh boy, cancel your plans. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, oh. we're in a house and we're so lucky. Our dryer is the shit, man. That's the best. A good dryer, you know. I don't, I don't want to. Well, I got to retire and move. Yeah, I don't want to brag too much, but man, I got a fucking dryer, man. It's good. <laughs> I've been 18 years of wet towels. <laughs> do you you probably stories like oh if the towel's a little moist it actually dries you better but that's not true <laughs> but you make uh, do you so, do this by the way because i've had to do this where you're like okay this will be the towel i use i'll immediately put it in the bathroom on the thing so i'm not bathing until tomorrow hopefully dry by then <laughs> oh yeah there's a the succession. There's a little daisy chain of towels. And like this one's too filthy, but um it's gonna stay in the bathroom for another day because I have one in there that's a little less filthy, and the other one's not dry yet. And then they all three <laughs> they'll rotate. Yep. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. I haven't done my laundry in a while, and it didn't matter because I have my own place to go do it. Remember the nightmare of like not doing your laundry for a while and packing it all in your dumb car? Oh my god. Oh, having seven quarters. 
oh, I got to find a quarter somewhere. And it's I'm on University Boulevard. And nothing's yeah. open past six. By the way, every store owner in existence, may I say something to you? Could you just understand that sometimes we need quarters and not make a big fucking deal about it? Especially if your business is right off a college campus. Just give us fucking quarters. You know, you could open a store where you could sell $10 worth of quarters for $11 and get rich. Yes. No one would mind. Students wouldn't mind. I can yep. get the quarters. I'll pay a little, a premium for access to quarters. Yep. You absolutely could do it. I now, don't... Do you think they still need the quarters, the college kids now? Or do they have like cards and apps? Oh, wow. I, man, I'm so... felt more elderly. Yeah. Probably the way I'm sitting doesn't help. Yeah. Do they need <laughs> quarters? And also, where's my pills? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I, that's a good question. Well, listen, I've been to laundromats recently enough, and there's still quarters. I bet they do need them because those people, oh, yeah. They're never far. I have one of those. I have one of those, yeah. yeah. It's it's Here's a funny running joke in my house now. So we have to give pills to the kitty and to the dog. My dog has heart beds. And to me, uh, so I have to put them in cheese for the dog and we have to trick the cat. And I've now made my wife trick me. <laughs> she has to trick me. And I, go, and I go, and she goes, no, you like cheese. And I go. <laughs> Great. It's a fun joke. I don't do it every time because honestly, the pill ruins the taste of the cheese. <laughs> Yeah, sometimes you have to just have the cheese afterwards. But I'm a big fan of the joke. It's a fantastic joke. <laughs> See, I told you that was a good clue, right? A real good clue as... and a real on point. All for oh, Lena, yeah. yeah. And, and what a great for... song that we have already talked about, but what a great <laughs> song. I believe also from Glass Houses, right? Glass Houses, that's correct. Other reason I picked it was I thought it would be fun to pick one of the hits off of that. Oh, yeah, I won't expect that every time. Hey, you shouldn't expect much every time. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Hey, man. Trivia. Billy Joel has had some number one hits. How many and what were they? Okay. Just the number ones. Just the number ones. I'm going to say he's had... See, I underrated him last time drastically. So first, I'm going to say 12 number ones. Down. Down. Okay. Six. Down. One. <laughs> Four. Three. Three. Okay. But Three let, me let me try. Piano Man. No. Oh. Barely cracked the top 40. Oh, that's, isn't that weird? That is still, that is odd. Uh, still rock and roll to me. One. Tell her about it. Yes. I knew it. I knew it. Because that song isn't one of his greats, but that is an accessible, fun little ditty. That's a fun song. A so I've got, I've got two of them. And let's yep. say to get the question, no extra guesses. I got to get it right. Okay. Because so, you've already been generous with me being way off. So the attention kills me. So I have to always confess. Still rock and roll to me. Tell her about it. And. All right. It's not going to be scenes from an Italian restaurant because you wouldn't. No way. So it's going to be uh, for the longest time. <laughs> We didn't start the fire. Idiot. Of course. I'm an idiot. Of course. I should have said that. That one was fucking huge and not a good song. And not a good song. Indeed. It's not a bad song. It's fine to listen to, but it's it's a little bit like American Pie. Yes. Which it's a fun. There's a novelty to how long it is. There's a novelty to how many damn words there are in it. Yep. 
By the way, you want to hear an interesting bit of trivia about American Pie? Yes. Who owns the publishing rights on that? Oh, God, I don't know. Would it not be Don McLean? It is, and that's incredibly unique. Before he was even famous, he oh. refused to sign away any of his publishing rights. <laughs> and in an interview, he said, it wasn't because I was smart. He said it was because I wrote them and it felt wrong for somebody else to own them. It turns out that has also made me rich. <laughs> but it was on principle. He was, he said there, he was turned down by multiple record companies for that reason. Yeah. Oh, I believe it. Because they know where the money is. And it was just that there was finally a record company who said, okay. Huh. And and now, now that I know that, I understand why when Madonna did the cover, he was a fan. Sure. Yeah. Great. By all means, buy me a house. Yeah. He, he said, oh, it's an interesting cover. I'm like, no, it isn't. No, <laughs> come, Don McLean, you son of a gun. You wrote two of the, one of the prettiest songs ever written. <laughs> Maybe one of the greatest songs ever written was written by him. And it isn't, you know, which one I love, right? Vincent. Vincent, oh my God, that'll break your heart. Killer. I he, he doesn't have to have done anything else, and he did. He did. All right, so man, I really enjoyed talking about a song that we thought was going to be terrible, but was only perfectly fine. Yeah, that's nice. That's a nice, very an Irish version of a pre pleasant surprise. That's right. That was hard to say. An Irish version. Irish version is hard to say. Yeah. Irish version of a pleasant surprise. It's very oh, that should be a warm up. Yeah, my you know, you've heard of the Irish goodbye. You know what an Irish goodbye at a party is, right? Uh, I, from behind, right? Anally. <laughs> yep. <laughs> That's right. That's it. That was my trivia question. <laughs> uh yes, I'm familiar. And I've also heard it called the a French exit. Oh, so, really? I think. And I don't like that because as an Irishman, I think that's ours. Yeah. Yeah. Fine um, for that. There's a guy, I don't remember, a friend of mine said he does the Irish hello, which is he doesn't go to the party. <laughs> Great. <laughs> like, I fucking love it. All right, what I, do we... I remember hearing someone in L.A. told me about the Irish exit, and I was like, you can do that? And it changed my life. Oh, God, yes. For 40 minutes every night out. I do either that or the, oh, right, I did already say goodbye. I never get it right. It's either I said nothing to nobody or constantly, hey, Bob, it was good to see you. Oh, you're right. I, yeah. Yeah, we did talk. You're right. Oh, yeah, yeah. We said the thing. Come back around. Hey, Bob. Yeah. All right. Number 68. What are we talking about? There's a song called A Minor Variation. I'm familiar. I'm barely familiar. Perusing titles in search of something to talk about. <laughs> Oh, that's one I don't know much about. It's an intriguing title. Yeah. It's musical in nature, although I'm sure there's a pun or something. Yeah. Hopefully it's not, the pun isn't minor and it's about a underage date. Don't about a seven-year-old who dates Hamlet. <laughs> dates Hamlet, yeah, that's right. <laughs> minor variation. But you know, without looking, my prediction is it's a lot of Parallels between being in a love relationship and musical things oh, that good chance. will get irritating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which is what we like the most of our Billy Joel. It's got a much more uh, generous lyric shape. <laughs> oh, so do your warm ups. <laughs>